So a very warm welcome to our 169th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And we've been doing these webinars for, well, 168 times before. And uh, um, the idea of these Thought Leadership Webinars is that what we do is we choose a topic and uh, the idea is to examine what the issues are, what the barriers to progress are, how we might think differently. So we're not trying to solve the world's problems today, we're trying to increase thinking. And over the last 168 webinars, we've been involving thousands of people, either as panelists and as an audience all over the world. Um, um, today's a particularly troublesome day, I should say, because we've got strikes here. We've got a major conference going on in two different parts of the world. Um, uh, but uh, um, nevertheless, uh, people, our panel are here. Thank goodness for that. So what I'm going to do in a minute, I'm going to invite our panel to introduce themselves and then uh, once they've done that I'll invite them to make an opening statement and they're going to be talking about in pride month about pride insecurity. Now I'm really excited about this one, really excited to hear some of the true issues from those involved about the LBGTQ plus community and about how they're experiencing this security um, sector. We want to know why inclusively matter, what the role of allies are, is the security sector really up for embracing change, in what ways, what are the barriers, let's find out more by introducing first our panellists and let's go first to Jane. Jane please introduce yourself. Uh, so good afternoon everyone, so my name is Jane King and I'm the uh, chair of the Security Commonwealth and also the co-chair of the Sec Security Commonwealth's EDI a uh, special interest group um, and we uh, we were the first organization to launch an EDI charter to go across um, all the associations in security and we were absolutely delighted to uh, be the first organization in conjunction I must say with the OSPAs of awarding the first EDI award uh, in the security uh, uh, sector. That's it from me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yes, the Commonwealth was, insp it was inspirational in that and instrumental as well, I might add. And not only did a great job in the UK, it sprang up across the world. Sasha, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Martin. It's a real delight to be here. Um, and my name is Satya. I am the Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion for IPSA. I'm also uh, the co-chair of the Security Institute's uh, a Rainbow Group, Rainbow Plus Group. I'm also part of Jane's EDNI group at the Security Security Commonwealth. Um, our, our my EDNI uh, uh, piece of work started around two years ago, and since then, you know, um, I'm co-chair of the industry's um, award-winning um, uh, special interest group, the the Rainbow Group. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate that. And now let's meet our third panelist. Seetan, can you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Seetan Masani. I'm the Director of Major Accounts and Strategy at Core Security. I also have the pleasure of being a member of the Strategic Alliance on the IPSA Board for EDNI, the ACES Committee for EDNI, and I have the humble opportunity to lead our very own EDNI award winning uh, campaign, Core Together. Um, which we were very humble in winning the very first OSPA EDNI or, or, or inaugural award back in February 2022. Thank you very much, Adisan. And you did it against tremendously difficult opposition, I might add. It was a very, very uh, uh, um, competitive category. That's our panel. Look, once again, people write to me all over the world and say to me, how do you get these people on the panel? And we just ask the best. And they normally say, yes, that's how we do it. So without further ado, then, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to invite each of our panellists now three minutes to make their open statement. They can say what they like about the subject area. It's up to them. They're the experts. When they've all three have finished, I'll invite you to uh, get your questions in. So you'd like to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Get your questions in early if you can. We've got quite a lot in advance as well today. So it, uh, um, it's uh, an engaging topic. But without further ado, then let's go back to Jane. And Jane, please, your opening statement. Uh, sorry, yes, your opening statement. Thank, thank you, Martin. Um, so, so the subject matter today is why inclusivity uh, matters and security sector. So let's just go back and just to give it a bit of context. So uh, I think everyone on the call uh, recognises that uh, June is Pride Month, which is a time dedicated to celebrating LGBT plus communities 
all around the world. It's not just UK, it's all, all around the world. And Pride's a celebration of people coming together in love and friendship and to show how far LGBT plus rights have come and how in some places there's still work to do. Um, so so there's, there's lots, so just to go back, so Pride started um, 50 years ago. London Pride uh, this year will be on the 2nd of July, which is a week on Saturday. And it's the 50th anniversary of Pride being, being in London. Um, and it also commem commemorates the, the Stonewall riots, which happened on the 28th of June, 1969, um, after raids from um, uh, on, on the New York Stonewall Inn, when uh, for the first time, LGBT plus people fought back against police and police brutality. So the Stonewall riots are a reminder that collective action is one of the biggest tools that the LGBT plus community and its allies have against homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. While much has changed since the 1960s and the 70s, homophobic and transphobic hate crimes in the UK are on the increase. And also there are still approximately 69 countries in the world that will criminalise homosexuality with new laws and restrictions against same-sex relationships coming into force year on year. You only have to look at the, uh, the, the international press to, to, to see that. Uh, the other thing that is of concern with, with Pride Month um, is that, that what we've seen over since uh, 2017, 18 and 19, 2019 being uh, the last Pride uh, before COVID, is that we see an increase in homophobic hate crime recorded uh, post Pride. And um, this year in the capital alone, there have been 1,483 homophobic hate crimes recorded in the capital and 154 of those have occurred in Westminster. So what, what we know is that post Pride, there'll be an in, increase in, 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 in those crimes against our, our community. Why does it matter? Because we are, the, we are the guardians. We will see this happening. And if we don't get it right in our own sector, then when are we going to get it right? Thank you, Martin. Yeah, what a stunning set of statistics that is. Don't forget, if you'd like to get your questions in, uh, um, don't forget the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen and we'll come to you as soon as we've heard from all panellists. Sadia, over to you. Can we hear what you've got to say, please? And you're right. open. Thank you so much for that, Jane. And just to personalise some of the stats that um, Jane's talked about, um, I've, I've been a passionate member of uh, this sector for 25 years. And um, I'm a big, I'm passionate about people, I'm passionate about the sector, but um, unfortunately I sit here today and I, for 25 years, have not been able to be my true self in the workplace environment. Um, and um, it's only been, only in the last two years where I've been able to do that. And, and where it comes from for me is, I, I want to be part of a, a sector that um, 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 encompasses and embeds um, inclusivity. I, I really don't want anyone else to experience what I've had to, and I know that other individuals from our, our community experience um, uh, day in, uh, day out. So it's, um, you know, we, we, we serve a diverse community and we protect a diverse community. And it's only right that actually, our own uh, our own sector is is reflective of that, and um, being as passionate as we all are, um, as you alluded to earlier, and I know my, my colleagues are, um, we, we we want we want to succeed, we want to to grow um, as a sector, and in order to do that, we've we've got to be we've got to be um, inclusive, and not just um, for our sector, but me being um, my true self in the workplace has had a real a real impact on my family, the society and everything else. So, um, and, 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 and it's, all, it's all positive. And why would I not want to replicate that? I have a, a duty of care to my, my, fat, my niece. I want her to aspire and grow up to be whoever she would like to be, uh, just no matter what her background, my partner is autistic. I wouldn't want her to come against any, any barriers um, uh, in terms of her hidden disability and so on. But in terms of, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll discuss and go through our um, updates today that look, there are, there are key areas that we could be uh, focusing on, channeling on as a sector to, to being more, more inclusive. And, you know, last year I was, 
I, I went, I attended Birmingham Pride and out of pain and I, I was really aggrieved that I saw West Midlands Police there. I saw other organisations there. I saw the finance, finance, finance sector there. And I'm looking around me and I'm thinking, everybody from the sector, security sector is there protecting this unique event. Mm. And, I, and I said to myself, we have to be part of this. I have to change this next year. And that's why I'm so proud that I've brought this initiative together. And for the first time, our sector will be collaboratively walking, marching at Pride this year. It celebrates 50 years. 50 years is a long time, uh, but look, we've, we've come to we've come to uh, to this um, to the table now, and it's important that and that we continue. But look, I have managed. I had a vision last year, and in six months, I can I, I've, I've you know with, with with the support of the allies, what can be done this year? Three hundred of the sector, my colleagues across the sector, will be marching at Pride with their employees. So it isn't just about the leaders, it's about their LGBT employees that are going to get a voice that are can celebrate and just be their entire selves. That is incredible. Thank you so much. I thought you were going to say 30 or so people would be. That is incredible. OK, really, really good. Don't forget, if you've got a question, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll come to you after we've heard our opening statement from CTAN. CTAN, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Satya. Over the past few years have seen many organisations incorporate a focus on LGBTQ plus uh, inclusion within HR and diversity, inclusion and equity uh, strategies. But with many employers making visible and vocal commitments to LGBTQ plus inclusion, both internally with their organisations and externally through uh, support of Pride events and beyond. While the visible and vocal commitment is a positive move, is it impacting the lived experience of LGBTQ plus employees when it comes to their everyday lived experience in the workplace. The concept of allyship is using your own position of power or privilege to elevate your colleagues is key to fostering not only diverse, but truly inclusive workplaces. Allies are a key part to the DNI process, bringing attention to the experiences of marginalized groups when their voices are not being heard. Voice and actions are symbiotic in the role of an ally, calling out inappropriate behaviour and actively using language as e is equally as important as sponsoring uh, the career of a person from an underrepresented community or rolling out the programme of unconscious bias training for your team. Making changes in this way is a process that requires self-proactivity as well as the ability, the ability to take in cues from the marginalised groups understanding where their input is needed and when it is more appropriate to allow others to deliver that message. The allies must be humble and courageous enough to admit to, the, to, admit to and address the mistakes that they will inadvertently make. Is our industry doing enough? Is our, is our industry still at the talking stage? We're not a glamorised industry yet such as competitive sectors like banking and finance, medicine, law, engineering, for example. All who run strongly funded graduate schemes to open and offer insight and opportunities to all, changing how our industry can make a difference. EDI groups are still within our industry are mostly volunteers, taking time out of their day-to-day -day jobs and busy uh, schedules to make impact change as a positive difference, as opposed to these glamorized sectors that I've mentioned previously, who have dedicated funded departments to impl in implement such change. We hope this afternoon we'll explore our collective efforts within the industry and how we can harness this energy and positivity in creating systemic positive change within our landscape. Thank you very much indeed. Listen, fantastic. Really, really, uh, really, really good. I wonder whether I, um, I could come back to you with the same question. It's a question you raised, Sita, and I'm going to come back to you first and ask you it. Is the industry really embracing um, um, everything involved with Pride Month? I mean, beyond the beyond CETA and the examples of good practice that we've heard from the three of you, is the sector properly engaged with this issue? It sounds to me as if the answer might be to a very limited extent. CETA. I, I would I would agree with your conclusion there. It is still 
at a limited stage. We as a security industry, and that's all I really have to, to benchmark my experiences with, is that we're scratching the surface on, on not just pride and not just representation for LGBTQ+, but a variety of ED&I um, uh, subject matter right across the entire spectrum. So I would, I would, we, we, I questioned within my opening statement, are we doing enough and are we still at that talking stage? It is for that very reason that I self recognize we've got to be doing more than, and with, it's with no disrespect to the, the positive changes and moves that we're making, i.e. being at Pride this year, collectively bringing the industry together. I mean, Sophia would probably give you some examples on how limited that, um, uh, See, Dan, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We're just having a okay. slight problem with your sound. So I'm just going to ask Hannah to liaise with you in the background while I come to um, Jane. Jane, if I can come to you next. I'll come to all three of you. Don't worry. Jane, if I can come to you next. I mean, I want to understand what's the barrier that, uh, that, that is being faced here that prevents the sector fully engaging? What's the barrier in security? And I'll come to you, to, uh, to, to, uh, you to, as well, Sophia. First of all, Jane. Um, I, th I, I think it's, it's, it's varied. I think some of it is lack of awareness. Um, so, you know, the role that the, the work that we do here is about raising awareness. The, the, there is also a, a very much, um, it depends what chair you sit on and what field of view that you have, where people say, well, there's not a problem. Well, if you say that, then it's because you don't recognise the, the problem. And, and, and of course, it's about embracing change, which is always very difficult for, for, for some people. Um, I, I, think, I think people need to realise what the real world is like. And actually, we, 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 need, to, uh, we need to broaden that, that telescope. Um, and, and part of that for me is, is about uh, changing how we recruit, where we recruit, because it becomes a like-by-like like mindset. And whilst we do that, then we won't change the thought process. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't recruit ex-police and ex-military um, because it has a place, says the girl who's ex-military. OK, however, what we need to do is we need in, in our organisation, in, in our industry, we need di diversity of thought, diversity of process, as well as diversity of people, because that's good business. And this is why CTAN touched on it that the private uh, uh, other sectors, so banking, et cetera, why they employ someone, because they recognise it's good business. It's good for business. Whereas I don't think that we've taken that on yet. OK, mm. thank you very much indeed. I'm going to come to you, Satya, on this same question. I know you were keen to yeah. get in. I yeah. want to understand what's the barriers to fully embracing this issue. Your thoughts, please. Well, I've um, in the in the two years, my experience has been that as a sector, we like to to entertain this conversation with lip service and individuals believe that having the conversation of ED&I, that's that's my bit of work done as an organisation. That's me. That's that's me done. And do you know what? Even let's go further and say, OK, my organisation Actually, we recruit a good percentage of women. We, we, we recruit a good percentage of the LGBT community and et cetera, et cetera, the nine protected characteristics. However, the, the bit that's missing, Martin, is where the education is needed, is the, ed, is, is the inclusion bit. Are they truly inclusive? How do they demonstrate that? How do they embed that in their everyday working? And, um, I, I, and also... Um, you know, for me, when I, I've, I, we didn't have these special interest groups. We didn't have a rainbow group. All these different types of conversations now that we're having and all the events that where I had the privilege of meeting you for the first time, um, nobody was having discussions. No one was having conversations. It was just, it wasn't, it wasn't part of our priorities as a sector. Um, and I just feel now, and it is again, I'll, I'll say, it's, it's the same individuals that are having the conversations and progressing it. But for me, I want the output. I want to see output. I want to see result. And I think that, that that's the difference between historically and what I see happening and, uh, in the last years. You've got to be part of the change. Be part of the change that you want to see. People just want to be, that all they're doing is discussing the change. It's different when you have to actually go out and um, put the 
changes into place into your organisation, embed them and etc. So. OK, thank you very much. Sina, I'm going to come back to you. I believe we've solved the, uh, the mic problem now. So you were just, you were just um, getting to the end of your answer. I just want to make sure I capture this point. Your views on your own question um, in the sense of is the industry ready for embracing this? Because it strikes me, what I've heard so far, it was lip service, that I, what I was saying. Sita, so just your reasons for the barriers. I think to, um, well, I'll throw um, a spanner in the works here for a debate, maybe later on in the session, but I believe the barrier, and, and no one wants to say it, is funding. Mm. It, it is that there is no focus or energy or funding to, within our um, approach commercially um, as an industry that ha we haven't answered that question and we haven't set that mm. framework up within our industry to make sure that it services our industry in the same way it does within the sectors I mentioned earlier in my opening statement. Well, I, we were I, I, very on, on a very personal level. I can share a personal experience. I was very humbled to be uh, shortlisted to the British Diversity Awards this year, and I was. We were core security myself was the only security company at these awards. Uh, surrounding me on every table and every nomination were huge powerhouses within mm. sectors I mentioned before with dedicated teams that are affecting far more change than the security industry are still only scratching the surface and mm. someone has mentioned lip service and that's not to be disrespectful of, of the efforts that we're making mm. but we're all doing it from heart energy and passion and 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 it's not being driven seriously enough from a funding perspective Okay, okay. I'm going to ask you all just, you've only got 10 seconds to answer this question, you three, all three. Headline issue, if there was one change you could make to bring about a change in attitude in the security sector, you've got a magic wand, the three of you, for a minute, you've only got 10 seconds to um, use it. What would you use? Send here first. What would you say? Um, education. Educate um, uh, your frontline, the middle management, right through to the board it's 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 key in terms of um getting the inclusion piece right jane your magic wand okay so edi has to be part of the employing boards uh strategy and it has to be part of their supply strategy as well okay see down recognition and support for our colleagues in more ways than just via employer routes what does that mean? What does that mean? So in the sense that whilst a, an employee will always turn to their employer for a set of support framework, we're a much larger industry within this within this world of ED and I. So to, to connect um, a framework of support for all colleagues right across our industry. OK, very, very good. OK, very interesting. We're going to come back to it. But I just wanted to crystallise the issue. Let me move on and let me come to uh, you first, Jane. And a question from Simon Chan. And it's about labels. And um, funny enough, funny enough, interestingly, just before I got there, I wondered whether when we called it, we called this uh, um, about pride that we entitled the webinar uh, um, Pride in Security. And I thought to myself, I wonder whether in some parts of the world they haven't picked up on the significance of the word pride. They mean proud of security rather than the word pride. I don't know. I'm just uh, sort of uh, just saying beforehand about 10 minutes before we started. Um, and Simon's term is, is the word Jane LGBTQ uh, plus label is it helpful uh, um and the word pride itself does that really convey well the uh, um the range of issues i'm just this labeling issue i wonder whether we could just tackle jane first is that a reasonable point to make or uh, not yeah so, so so it's something that we talk about all the time about labels so mm. so you know it, it, lgbt plus and and then there are other variants uh, C, mm. cita mentioned q you know they're, they're, they're acronyms to to describe um, the, 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 the group of people. I, I mean, so just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, LGBT plus is uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender, with the plus being an inclusive symbol to mean and others to include people of all other identities. Uh, and that, again, is part of the inclusion. So we're not excluding uh, a, a anyone and, uh, a, and people can, can create the, the, their own labels. Um, I, I, I think, you know, so, so pride, yes, it's, it's what, it's, what it's, it's historically known as, uh, as say, you know, the, uh, the, the pride um, uh, 50 years in, in London and, and it is celebrated everywhere. I think it has its, 
it's its own its own label. Um, so I do I think it's appropriate. I do, but I understand why people not involved and and who don't have an awareness maybe would be a, a little bit confused a bit. Um, um, Sita, let me come to you next. I mean, it just seems a bit of a mouth. It's not easy. I mean, look, maybe maybe it's it's uh, maybe it's just no big deal. I mean, we all know what it means, but it's or I think most of us do. Um, Sita, are you happy with it? Is the language a barrier? I don't feel that the language is a barrier, and I think if. Language can become a barrier if if, if it's not um, recognised from root levels, if that makes sense. Whilst the question was around label and whether that has, is a barrier to actually doing something about it, you're really measured on just what the framework is behind said label or le alleged label in terms of how we are reaching out, connecting with our people and supporting them. So I don't believe it really would act as a barrier unless the actions beyond that are, are causing um, you know elements for concern. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, Celia, what do you think? Um, uh, I'll give an example. Uh, when, when we set the Rainbow Group up, uh, Martin, we had various individuals that never got that right. So my views are probably similar to C Tan and and uh, Jane, slightly mixed. And you know, we just said refer to them as the Rainbow Group. And they did. That's how we, how the Rainbow Group was born. And um, let, you know, the the our the LGBT community, the, the LGBTQ community, um, are they are they, let's 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 affect their thinking and their feelings and thoughts on, on board here, and are they happy being referred to like that? In my view, and my colleagues will agree is that actually they don't mind that. But look, I also respect absolutely what the gentleman has asked that actually. If you don't want to refer to it, don't. You can refer to it as the Rainbow Group, whatever you see fit, and um, and that's how we how, how and why uh, the 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 Rainbow Group was born out of. But yeah, I, I have I have sort of like mixed feelings and, and, and views on on the subject because it can come across as as labelling. But um, you know the, the LGBTQ community have 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 had it for century. Well, sorry, for decades and. Yeah, quite happy with it. Okay, okay, really, really good. I, it's just this point about about yeah. Rainbow Group, LGG, which is a yeah. bit of a mouthful. Uh, Pride, I just, but, but okay, okay. Let me move on because I want I want to make sure I get into. Uh, Jane, did you want to come back on me on that? Then did you do? Did you, okay. No, okay. So I'd move on if I can very quickly. Yeah. Listen, um, I think one of the uh, um, questions that John Hilditch has asked is about examples of good practice. I mean, his actual question is diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. Are there any good examples of dancing within the industry? What a wonderful question. If I'd have been back in academia <laughs> university, I'd have set that on essays, it's so good. Um, um, but the point is about these good examples. And I wonder, um, one of the barriers may be perhaps the lack of good examples that can people latch onto. I'd like to hear from you, given the fact you've been critical of some of the initiatives of not being uh, truly embracing, what you would each put as a good example that we can point to and say, look at that, there is something that really is uh, having an impact. Sita, let me come to you first on this one. Um, if, I would, uh, if I can share our experiences of what we've done at Core, core Security within Core Together in, in terms of as examples of what good looks like, I'm, I'm, I'm even humble enough to say we're not even sure if, if that is, it is what good looks like. It's what, what we did is what we felt was right um, and heartfelt to ensure that our colleagues are supported. And, and for LGBT, LGBTQ plus um, re recognition month for February, for instance, we held weekly forums where individuals were able to link in with resources and charity based organisations where we could give talks and have uh, a, a healthy discussion that helps shape what we then do for years and months to come for the, the future coming events to help our colleagues. See, see then just this is for staff Correct. who are part of this community Correct. to bring in and get and, and what was the participation rate? I mean, sorry, what, how, how embracing did, did your community feel of that initiative? I mean, we've not been able to give you a hand on figure of the 3,000 no, employees that we employ are willing and comfortable enough to state that they are from that community. But those participants who are either from the community or wanted to be part of that 
showed a good 60 to 70 people across our business who wanted to engage and get involved. So now our guardian team for sexual orientation and gender are driving the conversation on a quarterly basis and shaping the way we do things with 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 um, with our communities from the sexual orientation group. OK, so so these weekly forums, they were an idea that um, you would you you felt was it had an impact, a positive impact. Correct. And we did it in the month of LGBTQ um, um, Awareness Month or Recognition Celebration Month to put light on the agenda and invoke and spark that conversation. But like I said, it's an example of something we're trying yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to just try and understand what you think is good practice rather than people outside uh, the community saying, oh, that's great. Uh, um, Cynthia, what would you say is, uh, let me come to you next. I would like to know what you think uh, is a, a good idea. I, I, I think that um, <clears throat> just on the uh, the back of that, um, quite similar, um, the, the special interest groups have been a real success. I think you're uh, aware of some of them. We've, we've set one up, uh, our Alliance Special Interest Group up at Alliance. We've got the Inclusive Security Special Interest Group at the Rainbow Group, uh, the, uh, that um, collaborates with the Rainbow Group. But for me, the, the, the collaboration between the sector has been a success. Um, from, I take pride as an example, I reached out to all the associations, I reached out to all the leading service providers and all of them actively, A, wanted to take part, wanted to know more about it, uh, want that journey to continue. So collaboration across, across our sector is key, but probably what was even more key for me, um, Martin, has been giving a voice to the LGBTQ community within the sector. So when an individual comes to me and says, look, Satya, we've never had anybody to turn to. Thank you for giving us a voice, not just giving them a voice, giving them a platform. Here's a webinar dedicated to you. Talk to us about your real experience so we can share that amongst the rest of the community. So, um, so yeah, that's what I, I think has been a, a real success. And these individuals never had a voice up until our webinars, our special in, in interest groups, our forums had been uh, created. But now, they're, not only are they embracing that, Martin, they're actually leading it. And to see that change within, within them is truly a, a, a celebration for us. I like this point about initiatives which give people a voice because that opens up a whole range of possibilities. I like that. I like. Jane, let me come to you, please. Um, again, Jane, I'd like to know what you would you would point to. You would point to as a good initiative. Okay, I, I think I think that, that there've been a few things, and uh, C10 and Satya uh, uh, touched on some of those earlier. I, I want to say something really tangible. Okay, is the the is the EDI OSPA. That's something absolutely real. The first in the industry, and actually what we're seeing now is uh, of other um, uh, events where there will be an, e an EDI. So we've opened the gates and people are realizing it's a really good thing. So I think that's a real tangible step forward, um, dancing in the community, if you like. I think it's, it's really noticeable that um, the associations in the security in industry, so the Security Institute, ACES, Etc. I don't want to exclude anyone. They have mm. set up these special interest groups and, and they are about inclusivity networks. Let's not forget, it's not just LGBT, it's the e EDI of which LGBT is, is one part. And also, I, I do want to mention that in the public sector, I think in EDI, I think, I think we're a bit ahead of the game on that. And one of the real noticeables for me is about the rainbow badge being worn in, in the NHS. Um, and, and, and that was launched in October 20, 2018, and uh, my organisation, um, we, we took it on in History Month of 2019, and it's now recognised um, across the UK, and has, uh, has actually been picked up by NHS England, and will be used as a, fr as, a, a, as a framework to assess trusts uh, and hospitals, healthcare organisations, on, on their EDI. So a fabulous example of how we've taken something forward. Well, it's that fabulous. Can can the security sector get this or not? Uh, not not this actual rain, rainbow badge, but I think the principle is absolutely right. 
Okay, how interesting. Okay, mm. didn't know that. Um, okay, let's move on to Steve Arnold. Um, he's, I'd like to put this question to all of you, but uh, Satya, I'm going to come to you first because uh, um, it's about engaging within the sector, upper management and board. Now, mm. I would expect them to say the right things. Satya, maybe I'm wrong, but I would expect in any credible company, the upper management to say the right things. Uh, um, it might be a bit difficult sometimes to in, 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 in engage the front line, meaning if I don't know, maybe you're gonna correct me. Um, the question is, how do we, uh, do, you sense a, do you sense a prejudice amongst some colleagues and what's the strategy for an across your own organization approach to exposing uh, issues and then tackle them? All three of you are gonna come to this, it's a biggie. Um, yeah. um, Satya, I'm going to come to you first, please. Yeah, uh, I, I, I personally have not had exposure to it, but I am aware that um, prejudice does exist. Um, but for me, I, I, you know, having that conversation is about trying to understand. And I, and I talked about that, that education piece about, um, and, and I, don't, I don't think that it's just, a, a management thing. I, I, I think that it's something that that uh, any organisation could be exposed to. It could be at the front line. It could be at management. It could be at it could be at um, leadership level. But it's about having that right framework within an organisation where an individual can go to and say that look, um, when this happens, um, that these are uh, these are the um, uh, these are the options for me to escalate my queries my concerns and 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 etc so um i mean we you know our our own um ips's own um processes are actually just this we don't tolerate any type of uh discrimination and actually it shouldn't be accepted it should be called out and um and it and it should be and personally i had my the time that i was i had to i was discriminated against because of my sexuality again i escalated it within an organization uh, straight away they dealt with it they kept me updated there was a process that I had to follow and I went through that entire process I was and, and they were we were their service provider and so on and and I took I took I was aware of their own process in terms of um, what I need to do to deal with the, their own discriminating their, their own discrimination processes and policies and I, and I followed that but it's key to have that mechanism in place uh, first and foremost, to make sure that we are protecting the individuals that we are that we are employing and trusted to do to be part of our organisation. I say, just for clarification, that was in the security sector. That example, yes, it was. Abs yes, okay. it was. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Ctan, is it possible to really challenge this unless the leadership are absolutely engaged? If they're not engaged, everything's on the run. And and if is it the is that true? A C ten. And if it's true, would you say across the security sector the leadership are sufficiently engaged to make those things happen? C ten and Jane, the same kind of question is coming to you. Uh, the answer to that question is uh, if unless if you do not have leadership engagement, board engagement this dissolves, it's a non-starter, it just doesn't move forward. Um, it needs the inspiration and the motivation from the leadership team and the real belief to be able to go out and make that impact change to not just their own staff and network, but of course make that change within the industry. So we're quite fortunate at Core Security where I am, um, sit on a senior management team that reports into the board and I have to develop a board report on EDNI to our board annually. And part of, of those discussions has helped us make it agenda for change. I'm stealing Jane's uh, uh, term there, but we've made it an agenda for change within our own organization to ensure that it becomes an invoking conversation with our client base as well. So you'll find now our operators have a monthly agenda with their contractual uh, clients, and it's part of the agenda on our portal with our clients that they must cover off elements of ED&I. How can we promote? How can we celebrate? And what examples of good practice do we have on our own location? So that's how you uh, that's how you can or is an example of how you can uh, you know systemically change behaviours within your your own organisation. Yeah, I like that, uh, Jane. Uh, over to you. I mean, this issue about uh, leadership is absolutely crucial. Uh, are they? Are they in the security sector, Jane? Uh, can't, what can't, they might say? 
<laughs> um, currently, uh, no, we're, we're, we're not there and, and we know we're not there. But I think there's some real quick wins and, and CTAN's absolutely spot on with what he's saying. But what I would like to see, it's not just about policies and procedures. It's not just about a HR tick box. It has, it has to be pushed by the security professionals. And that's on both sides of the coin. That's on the supplier um, and, and, and the people ha having the service. And I think how we do it, so I mentioned it earlier, is it has to be part of the company's strategy at board level. There needs to be a board level champion. It needs to be reported on in the annual report. We want to know who those inclusion agents are. And, and from that, you will then get, you know, the power of a workforce that is inclusive. And, and it's where, you know, LGBT people will, will be accepted without exception. Um, but, you know, we, we know it's not, it's not a given. Um, and people need to understand that staff need to bring their whole self to, to, to work. And, and why? It's because inclusion drives better individual business and organisational outcomes. It is, apart from being morally right, it is good business sense. And that is what we've seen in the private sector when CTAN alluded earlier to finance, you know, banking, et cetera. They get it and we need to get it. Well, that's a good point, because uh, Cito, let me come back to you on that, because you did say, I think, that that hasn't been commercially shown to be the case in the security sector. You haven't. And I think that's very dangerous, isn't it, in a very sort of largely commercially driven sector where the bottom line counts, which is not unreasonable, of course, um, as, a, as a principle in its own right. Um, and that's why not, Cito? Why is why is that case not being made? The bottom line, the bottom line counts for all sectors. I, I mentioned finance, banking. They have a bottom line, just like security has a bottom line. It's a business. It's an industry that wants, you know, to go out and, and make uh, profits and make a success of it. Absolutely, but they make, they have budgets and they have budgetary controls for other departments. They need to recognise that the EDNMA function. And, and don't just lump it onto HR departments because mm. they're already stretched and they're already uh, saturated with the work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's got to be taken seriously for there to be a uh, systemic change. And the reason I'm quite passionate about that is because I've come from a graduate training scheme myself. And so I know the product that comes out of a graduate training scheme that you can then get to the levels you need to. And that it is a fair and inclusive world giving opportunities right across the spectrum, which is which is a wonderful thing to do. Hanel, thank you so much. I've got these questions here from all over the world. We haven't got to many of them because uh, it's such an engaging topic. There are so many issues. I think one of the, the interesting things is that if I could summarise, and they're my words, not any of yours, progress is being made a lot more to do and uh, um, let's return to this uh, maybe in a year's time and see whether there's been a sea change in attitude. And thank you very much, indeed, panel. Thank you very much, indeed, audience. And for those who are going to watch this afterwards, because it will be on the website tomorrow, people send me questions because they couldn't be here. And I haven't got through a lot of them, but uh, we did tackle a lot of good issues. And thank you very much. Indeed. Absolutely fascinating. OK, um, um, just a few more final comments from me, just to say to you all that um, um, the Osprey events are closing uh, soon. The US closed on the 5th of July. Benelux on the 11th of July. Canada on the 18th of July. And then in the, the month of August, we've got the Tackling Economic Crime Awards, Cyber Ospers, South African Ospers and German Ospers all closing. So you've still got time around the world, but you need to get your entries in. Don't forget, this is about recognising those who are outstanding at what they do. It matters. It's a big deal. Uh, finally, to say, and I think Zitan set me up for this, actually, in his comment, because he said, talked about HR. And that's the topic of the final webinar before we take a summer break. It's this time next week. HR and finance. Do they support or undermine security? I've got a feeling some of the issues our panel raised today will be equally relevant there. So thank you once again for Hannah in the background and Christine and Shrey who uh, helped me put all this together. Thank you to the audience for your questions and uh, for your participation. Especially thank you to the panel. Uh, um, really appreciate those insightful comments. Um, until we meet again, wherever you are in the world, stay safe. Thank you. Cheers.